Excellent. Um, my name is Kai Singh. Uh, by the way, before I start, uh, I'm just curious uh, if anybody agrees with me. I'm, I'm, I'm actually wondering if Ashley would consider doing a talk because I think I'll be interested to listen to her <laughs> think about it. Okay. So, um, this is the last one, right? A um, little bit sad, a little bit sad, uh, but I'm really excited to be sharing my thoughts. Uh, before we do that, maybe let's uh, shift uh, the room a little bit. Uh, would you mind helping me with a little bit of a favor? Can you just maybe shift your posture and just sit up a little bit more? And maybe just take a deep breath, long deep breath in, and just breathe it out. And another one, um, could you just turn to, to somebody just beside you, can be in front, behind, at the side, and just say, good job, you're almost there. Just tell, tell everybody, good job, good job. <laughs> All right, okay, we can start. Um, I'm, I'm hobbling a little bit because actually I twisted my uh, ankle about one, two days ago, so if I'm hobbling, just, just bear with me, okay? All right. So my talk is going to be about uh, better design by looking outwards and seeing and learning from other disciplines outside of design. And actually, the talk um, that I want to give now is quite interesting because I took a sabbatical, so a personal sabbatical. So I stopped my job of leading a design studio for five and a half years. Um, I took a break for six months, and now I'm sort of out of that break. But that six months was wonderful. I highly recommend it to people. Uh, because what happened for me was I lined up all of my days just chatting with different people that I didn't get to meet. And I learned so much about that. And this talk is really uh, a summary of my learning from everyone and a reflection of that. Yeah. And it starts off, I don't know whether you are having some uh, overdose of Venn diagrams, but I'm going to add another one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I should go. <laughs> so uh, you, you've seen this, right? Familiar? A little bit familiar? All right. So <laughs> and I think the, the interesting thing is when I talk to people, everybody had this mental model of how things should be done. There's business, technology, some call it users, some call it design. There is the design thinking we are doing, with, doing it, which is uh, viability, feasibility, and desirability. So there's a lot of this. Um, but I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> but the thing I hear from a lot of people is this. Kai Seng. I keep trying to convince my organization or my team or my boss that the right thing to do is fill in the blank. More user research, ethnographic work. We need to iterate. Let's not take everything in. But they just won't listen. And repeatedly, that seems to be the story for, for everyone that I meet, almost everybody I meet. Um, and I don't know if that resonates with all of you. Does that resonate? You can snap or clap or whatever if you, if you think that's <laughs> just to follow Ben. <laughs> yeah, if you can't snap, clap. Yeah. And I think what we are really describing is this. Everybody's describing, yeah, there are the three bubbles, but the design one is the smallest one. It doesn't have that much influence, really. Yeah, snap, snap. Right, thank you. And the question they always ask is, how do I grow this bubble? How do I grow design so that it can match either the business side of things or the technology side of things? And it got me into a spin because I don't know <laughs> the answer. And so I started to ask design leaders, what do they do? How do you grow this? And I, to be honest, I didn't get a very satisfactory answer. And that's why I knew in that six months, I had to go out of design. And maybe somebody else has done this. And so I'm bringing in uh, two other disciplines that do this well. But I'm going to just share one thing I learned about each one of them. So I'm just going to share two things, two concepts. The interesting thing is when you talk about people who are really frustrated, um, 
the story of Cassandra comes to me. So for those of you who don't know, uh, in the Greek mythology, Cassandra is actually a princess of Troy. And that's Cassandra. There's a more famous uh, sister called Helen. And what really happened uh, in this famous story is the Trojan horse. So the Greeks wanted to conquer Troy, the city, uh, but it really couldn't get in. So what they did was they sort of asked everybody to retreat. They built this really big uh, statue uh, of, a, of a horse, and then they hid a few people inside, some soldiers. Obviously, the Trojans came out, oh, very happy, they ran off already. We're going to pull this in and celebrate. And then in, in the night, the Greek soldiers came out, opened the doors, and then saw Troy, Troy was gone. So how is this relevant to Cassandra? Cassandra actually saw the future, and she saw this happening. And she wanted to tell her, her father, the king, and her brother, but they didn't believe her. So the interesting thing is, how did she see the future? Well, actually, she was in a relationship with a god called Apollo. I think back then, Greeks, Greek gods loved to have uh, relationships with humans. <laughs> um, so he actually gave her the gift of foresight, which we talked about in the previous um, presentation. So that's awesome superpower, right? 4D all the way and lottery. Um, but the thing was, she then said, I would, she sort of said, ah, you're not my type. I'm going to swipe left. <laughs> and he was angry. But the, so there's a, there's a criteria. Once, once a god gives you a power, they cannot take it away. So what he did was he added an additional curse. And the curse was, you can see the future, but nobody will believe you. That is the curse. And that is a terrible curse. And that's why um, Troy fell. So there's a Cassandra complex, right, in design. We've experienced frustration with people who do not believe the valid concerns we raise. We see it. We know it. You have to do the research. This is not the right way to do this. Why don't all of you believe me? You, you can sort of see the city burning behind her. And in a way, we are seeing our organizations burn, right? Wasting time, wasting effort. You know, you do multiple revisions and then you go back to the first revision at the start. Because that's what the boss says. So, so how, do you, how do you prevent this? And what do we want to work with? Well, one thing is actually, well, you first, you have to have valid concerns. And you have to, as designers, maybe learn from Cassandra and actually see what's happening in the future. Yeah? And so I went out. I'm not a cat, but I sort of looked out and we said, okay, design can't do this. Let me go out and take a look. So I was going with the question about how can we be more rigorous in forecasting into the future? And the three questions that I came up with is, how do you see what's coming? How far ahead can we see? And then how can we change the future if we, it's something that we realize is not good, right? It's going to burn our, our city down. So what I really was looking for was the theory and practice of looking to and thinking about the future, especially long, medium term, so that we can anticipate and prepare for the changes. That was really what I was looking for. Uh, it took me a while, but I did find it. So there are people and conferences and huge groups of people practicing this, and it's called Futures Thinking. It's a bit younger than design thinking, and they're not as popular, but they're up and coming. So Futures Thinking is the first discipline that I sort of encountered. And let's let's um, take a little look into it, and there's, there's tons of stuff, but I'll just pick one thing right, for today. What Futures Thinking is not is predicting the future. And you can see how very easy we go into that mode, right? With Nokia and Forbes saying, well, can anybody really catch the cell phone king? Well, there's a certain prediction there, which is that it will keep coming on strong. So it's not really about predicting one future, the future that you're seeing. It's also not thinking the future is what's happening now, and you plus and minus 10%. You know, there's a certain linear way we think about the future. It's going to be a bit more of what's happening now, a bit less. It's not really like this. 
right? And I'll go into a, so, and this is a familiar diagram. It's, it's not a Venn diagram, but it's something that uh, the previous speaker has already shared. There are probable futures. So in futures thinking, practitioners think about probable futures, plausible ones. So I'm, I'm going to speed through because we already run this through. Possible ones. And actually, there's one more, preposterous ones. These are where your black swans are, if you read Nasim Taleb. These are the ones that come behind you and blindside you. And what futures thinking practitioners do is they practice thinking about the preposterous ones and all of the others. So I was like, wow. And they also add another one, which is the preferable ones, which are the ones we really want. And then we sort of, sort of get everybody along to that journey. Yeah? So for example, uh, Elon Musk, let's all go to Mars. Or well, some, the rich ones, I guess, go to Mars. And so there are many futures, not just one. You're not tied to one future. It's not a railroad track. There's many. And the interesting thing, I think, is futures thinkers prototype different futures to test their assumptions of what's happening now. So in a way that designers prototype interfaces, um, colors, variations of blues, and products and services, uh, futures thinkers prototype the future. Because if you think about your product and service in one linear form, what if that future doesn't happen? Then your feature or your product is going to be a bit um, off, or it's not going to you're not going to react so well to it. So maybe in terms of that, designers can also think about what are the different futures and stress test our products and services and our new concepts and features so they can see whether it survives all the futures that we think about. That's one thing. And uh, Jake, I think um, the Institute of the Future was just here two weeks ago, um, but I really love this quote. It's better to be scared by a simulation than blindsided by reality especially startups, I think. So I'll, I'll start with uh, one concept I learned in futures. Whoa, that's a huge wolf. I was just looking back and I was like, whoa, okay. Um, and this is a story about Yellowstone Park in the US. Um, back in the 1950s, the Yellowstone and the park rangers had this thing about uh, protecting the park visitors. Yeah, so you would uh, go to the park, the visitors, and then because they are part of the park, you sometimes meet wolves, and that's dangerous. So what they did was they set up an agency to do predator control. So systematically in the 1940s and 50s, they started to kill the wolves so that um, we don't get scared when we see one. And that was great. So, and you, if you Google this online, you can actually see uh, each year how many wolves were killed until there were none in the late 1950s. Well, what they didn't anticipate in terms of the future was, well, because the wolves were gone, there were more elk and bison. Because there's no more apex predator. And they started multiplying. They multiplied so much that they had to kill them. Why? Because they're eating the vegetation, even the small young shoots, so much that they devastated the entire uh, Yellowstone Park. So when he went there, it looked like this, like really sad. You know, it wasn't nice vegetation and things like that. And so they started killing them by the hundreds, and they couldn't kill enough. So while they could kill all the wolves, they couldn't kill enough elk, and they kept growing and growing and growing. Like, wow, okay. But then what happened next? The beavers left. Because the beavers didn't have the vegetation to eat, because the elk and the bison ate them all up, the beavers left the rivers. So they didn't build any more dams. So what happened? The rivers deepened, widened, and the rivers changed. So actually, you can't really see, um, unless it's on hindsight, but killing wolves changed the direction of rivers. 
And that's what we call in ecology, ecology trophic cascades. One thing leads to another, to another, to another, until it's irreversible. And now what they've done is, oh, let's put the wolves back. <laughs> so they have, and they've successfully repopulated the wolves. The elk have reduced numbers, awesome. The eagles have come and all these kind of things, but they could not change the rivers back because the beavers wouldn't come back to the deeper river. So some things can be reversed, some things cannot. And that's really important for us to think about in terms of our impact as designers. So this is called, uh, and this is the technique, so for those of you who love techniques and tools, this is called the futures wheel. And what it does is you just first put a trigger event in, you map out what is the first order impact, what will happen because of this thing. So, oh, great, let's put this button here, and then let's see what's the impact on this. And then you realize, oh, that impact also has impact. And you do a second order impact. And you think about what's the second stage that's going to happen. And then you do a third. And then you do a fourth. And you go nth level. So nth, uh, for those of you who do programming, it just means you just keep carrying on. And it's a really important, I think, for designers to think about nth order impact. Because if you don't, you create problems, like Mario said. Awesome, right, e-commerce? Well, we're having transport problems because of it. Great, right, recommendation engines? You create uh, echo chambers, and then you get Cambridge Analytica, and you get the destruction of uh, the democracy. I'm not sure Amazon really thought about, oh, by doing this, uh, because you read this and you bought this, I think you also like this, can trickle down to the collapse of trust in a democratic system. But that happens, and we need to start thinking about this. This one was an interesting one I saw on Twitter uh, of a classroom management system. So awesome, you know, uh, you're not following instructions, minus points, great. Uh, oh, good teamwork. Right, nice, great day, awesome. And then, oh, you went to the restroom, minus one point. <laughs> huh. So what is the first order impact of this? Less people will go to the restroom, I guess. What's the second order impact? People get bladder issues at five years old. Uh, so it's really important we understand this. And what we're really putting out into the world. And this was an awesome one. So one of the early Facebook designers talked about, sometimes you don't know something's wrong until it's too late. Spoken by a Facebook designer. Mm. <laughs> right. So the point is, I don't think we are always doing bad stuff. And we're not intentional, right? And I think we should definitely celebrate the benefits and the outcomes and the successes we have designed for, right? We have given those that are unbanked ways to do banking, you know, we've given people who are not able to have employment, employment, flexible employment, right? Whether it's through uh, food delivery or driving, and that's awesome. But we cannot continue to ignore the secondary and unintended impacts caused by our designs. Because somebody is paying for this, and it's not you. Somebody else in the society is paying for this, and there's no product owner for that. So there's no product owner for climate change in the world. So understand, when the problems get pushed all the way up the ecosystem, you know, from interaction all the way to systems level, all the way to ecosystems level, there's no one owner, and there's no, when there's no product owner, nobody solves that problem. And we have to understand this. Wow, very serious, huh? <laughs> so there's some people who wrote about this already. So my awesome book. Um, you can buy it on Amazon and get it shipped to you, I guess. <laughs> Consider the carbon footprint. And there are these things. Uh, so the Artifact Group um, also created these things. You can download this online. It's free. It's called the Tarot Cards of Tech. And it actually help you to explore the nth order impact of your work. Uh, it's really beautiful and nice. I'll give you an example of this. So one of them called the radio star. Who or what disappears if your product is successful? 
So if you get what you want, or you get double or triple of what you want, and you get a great bonus, who loses their job because of your product and service? What other products and services are replaced? What industry will be effect, uh, affected? And that's maybe something, uh, you don't have to own it, but think about it. And maybe that's the first step. Just think about that and level, level impact. So, just to summarize this first part around future thinking, uh, maybe yeah, be like Cassandra in that you can predict the future or forecast, learn from future thinking, uh, Google, there's online courses, think about it. And just one sort of technique to use, think about the nth order impact. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to move on to the second one. This is another story I've heard during my sabbatical. I read and hear about success stories all the time. When I try it myself, it doesn't work as well. You know, ideal does it, and they turn out, it turns out fantastic, but when I try it, I get a, uh, okay, we'll just do what we want. Like, great, great, but don't do that anymore. Yeah. So why, why is this happening? And that's also something I was thinking about. Uh, and I don't think design has a, has a ready answer for this. Mm, I think most of it is like, you know, increase your influence, talk to your stakeholders, convince your stakeholders, but I did, and this is what happens. So what I realized was actually doing the design work doesn't mean it grows your circle. And I think a lot of designers assume if you do great work, you increase the circle. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And if there's such inconsistency, maybe doing the work is not the factor. Maybe there's something else. So what is the maybe? So go back to the Cassandra complex. So valid concerns, you can get it, great. But let's talk, ta tackle the frustration. We experience that frustration, right? So I went out, okay, look again. What can we do apart from just doing design well and hoping it convinces others? Yeah, how many of you, I'm curious, how many of you have got this question? Like, okay. So the three questions that I was asking myself was, how do we get people to appreciate our work more? How do we implement such change at scale? And a lot of people ask me, how do we shift the culture in my current organization? Because it's not really working out. I can sort of see the resonance by the people sort of taking their phones up. <laughs> and so this is what I was really searching for. Is there a theory and practice of successful organizational change through you know, um, structured ways of doing things that impact and shift and improve the attitudes, beliefs, and um, values of employees? Well, yes, somebody has been doing it uh, for a long while, have run conferences, <laughs> and have a lot, of, a lot of practitioners doing it. So we don't really have to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from them, right? This is the field of organizational development. So you want to learn about organizational change? And you don't have to invent stuff. You don't have to think of your own frameworks. There are already tons of frameworks out there. And they are researched. And it's interesting. So uh, when I went to OD and looked at it, <coughs> it's amazing. They also are in love with their tools and techniques. And I see this common thing between OD practitioners, designers, even futures people, they love their techniques. And you yourself might be really interested and energized by learning something. Oh, let's go for a workshop, let's sign up for this, let's go and do this online course. And let's learn this new way of doing journey maps. And we're constantly, constantly, constantly looking for more tools. Like I have a friend, bless him, I love him. He created this site called Public Design Vault. Google it, he's got 500 tools. Awesome, and there are books like Universal Design which sort of collate like 100 techniques and tools. But yeah, that's a lot. But there's something different about OD. They do know about their use of tools and they want to have mastery in them. But there's this other thing called the use of self. 
what is this? I was really curious. And the use of self is essentially to become aware of and fully bring forth who you really are as an instrument to create impact. So you are the tool and the method itself to carry this out. And it's as strong and effective as any tool. So if you think about it, right, if you're hiring a designer to do something, you don't ask, do you use Figma? And yes, okay, great. You ask, who are you? What are your design sensibilities? And can you tell a story? You, know, you really talk about the person and the craftsman rather than the tool they use, right? You don't say, oh, you use a mouse? Oh, great, okay. Let's, let's, uh, what type of mouse do you use? No, you don't. You ask about the person. And likewise, they, they are very, very particular about use of self. So can you maybe stand your, uh, maybe, maybe can you bring your voice in the room when it's needed? Can you stand your ground like that? No, I'm just joking, it's the other foot. Can you use humor to disarm? And tell a difficult story through humor, you know, a tough uh, situation. Can you be inviting and loving and inclusive when needed? You know, or can you be really strong and stable when all the chaos and there's headless chickens running around? Can you really, really, really ground yourself? These are all different ways to use yourself. And apparently, they've done a lot of research and they have uh, scoured a lot of books across multiple industries and they found that there's nine aspects to use of self. Okay, not, this is not a Venn diagram, yeah? <laughs> so the interesting thing was, the person who did this was Mian. And Mian literally wrote the textbook on OD. So she's like one of the strongest practitioners uh, in OD and this is her research, so that's awesome. And so I'm going to share very, very quickly what are the nine things. The first set of three, cognition and how well you can think, emotion and courage. These are the three aspects of use of self that happens in the now. So when you're in the meeting and somebody's upsetting you, these are the three things you bring in the moment to help you. <clears throat> so in cognition, you look at strategic and how systematic you think, whether you can frame and reframe things. You know, Deep industry knowledge is useful, obviously. Whether you can separate data from interpretation. The he said, she said, and I think. In emotion, being empathetic, and that's something I think we all have, so I'm going to skip this. Do you have a positive regard for everybody else? So we talked about seeing developers and product managers as one of us. Can you read reactions in the room? Are you comfortable with vulnerability? And encourage, you're really looking at, can I do things myself? Am I a self-starter? Do I have internal power? You know, can I be evocative? Can I be provocative when I need to? And then lastly, can I dare to differentiate myself in the room? When I know my voice is different and others have been heard, but mine is a different voice and I don't seem to uh, dare to speak out. So that's something you need in the near term. There are three others that you need in the medium term for use of self. And this is the, your character, your skills and your values. So they're a bit longer, as you can see. And they found great OD practitioners with use of self are extremely trustworthy. They have humility, and we talked about that, I think, in the previous one. Uh, desire to serve, non-judgmental, and are patient. Skills-wise, you're generally a very good listener. Uh, you can tolerate confusion and ambiguity. Short, sharp, sweet. You can experiment, and you've got inquiring mind. I mean, there's some of this which we already have, I think, in the room, yeah. Um, and values. Do you really value diversity and inclusion? Are you fair? Are you always learning? Do you collaborate? And do you have really true humanitarian values? 
these are the three in the medium term that you want to develop for use of self. And the last three, for extremely long-term use of self, self-work, working on yourself, improving yourself, managing yourself, and continuous growth. So this is quite, um, I'll just speed through this. So it's investing in your own inner work, being aware of yourself, you know, boundaries. Some people have extremely hard and tight boundaries. Some have very loose boundaries. How do you manage them? Being authentic, and being authentic might not mean being your best self, right? It means be, maybe showing your ugly side a bit sometimes. Um, mindfulness was a very big thing. And then working on your unresolved issues. So these are your, um, how do you call this? When something happens, somebody says something and you go into a rage. Like, and the, the person is like, what? It's just a small thing. And you're so angry. That is a signal that's an unresolved issue. It could be things in your past, your trauma, father, mother issues sometimes. Intentional. Everything you do has a reason. And you want to have self-care. And self-care doesn't mean um, you go for a movie, or you get a massage. Uh, self-care really means taking care of yourself in the long term. Being in the right jobs, working with the right people that um, fulfill your life. And self-management. Getting high-impact skills, renewal, being non-reactive to challenges, and then being able to separate your needs from others. And the last one is like a catch-all, which is just keep working on all nine. So here you have it. These are the nine um, aspects by, that Mian has sort of researched on. And let's put that front and center. So the question is, wow, that's a lot of, of work, you know. Uh, it's a lifetime and more of work. So how, 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 how do we know where to start? Uh, so she also did some research. She interviewed thousands of practitioners and sh they, she asked them, what are your priorities? So let's take a look at the priorities so that you, we can also prioritize, right, into a backlog. So how do you improve this? There are five top ones. The biggest one that's top voted is really deepening your understanding of your own self and why you do things, and why are you not doing things, and why are you scared of these things, and why are you afraid of these things, uh, anxious about these things, why are you angry about these things? Why do they trigger me? So because once you know that, you can work on it. Second one is, how do I impact others, and how do others impact me? Uh, but number one is by far, like quite, quite far away, voted. Three, four, five are quite bunched up. So this is like working on your unresolved issues. Groundedness. So can I stay calm when a difficult situation is happening? And then general emotional management and self-management. Getting deep industry knowledge is not one of these five. It's important, but not one of the five. So how do you do this? How do you work on these things? So part of the survey, they also ask, what activities do you do? What do you do? To, to develop yourself in this. Top one is this reflective practice, mindfulness, retreats, spirituality. I'm not sure if that really, um, really is uh, going to impact that, but a lot of pr practitioners essentially voted this as the main one they'll do. Number two, keep on practicing. Having a coach and mentor is also extremely critical. And then seeking feedback. I think some of the speakers talked about this already. And the last one, awesome. You're already doing it. Yeah, so attend conferences, forums, network events. But there's a caveat. It's not just about attending it. It's finding people, like-minded people, to connect with afterwards. So if you haven't found a nice friend, maybe after this, I don't know if they're drinks, but yeah, try to find somebody to connect with and continually practice. And that's the main thing. All right. So that was OD and use of self. So don't be like Cassandra. Don't be frustrated. Uh, but learn from OD and be extremely intentional about use of self. And start focusing and becoming aware of how are you in the room with your stakeholders or with your friends or with your 
collaborators. Yeah. So I'm going to end with this. Um, and this is the story of a policeman who finds a drunken guy who is on his knees on the floor on the street, underneath a street lamp. And so the, the policeman was like, hey, what are you doing? And the guy said, oh, I'm looking for my uh, wallet and keys. And it's like, is it here under the light? He said, no, I lost it somewhere else. He's like, why are you then searching here? And he's like, no, that's where I can see stuff, you know? Because I can't see it in the dark, right? So how can I find it there? I think my message is don't let design be the lamppost. If nothing's working for you or something's not working for you, maybe don't search in the light. Search somewhere else. And so today I've shared a little bit about OD, you know, use of self, a little bit about futures thinking, and thought of impact. Uh, but you all have got different ways of doing this. You know, improv theater, film school for some of you, uh, martial arts, cooking. There's many, many other ways you could sort of think about what you can bring in. And I think what I would like you to do is, if you're having difficulties in design, maybe look outwards and bring something back into design and en enrich the design field. And maybe you'll be surprised and somebody else can learn from that as well. And that's all I have for you. So, thank you. Um, if you've got things you want to think about and talk about, uh, feel free to sort of connect and let, let's, let's continue the chat. Yeah? All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that interesting talk. Okay, now. Are you going to give one? <laughs> right now, just <laughs> kidding. No. <laughs> Have you been practicing futures thinking? Can you give an example? So I have been reading up for about five years now. Have I? Yes. Can you give an example? I can say no, right? <laughs> because it's a close ended question. Okay. No. Um. I can. Um. So an example. Uh, can we talk about it? Okay, so we worked with the Ministry of Education in Singapore and they were talk thinking about the future of learning, 10 years time, what's going to happen. And so we had the, quite a lot of high level divisional directors. Um, and I think one thing that we questioned, so one of the things we thought of is, well, most of education is now in schools. What if we cannot reach the school? then where does the education happen? Because now all the teachers go to school, the students go to school, right? This is the basic assumption we have of the present way education works. What if it cannot happen? So we talk about like, you know, what if there was climate change and we had to take boats to school? But if you think about it, it might be a bit silly to think about, you know, um, flooding and schools being inaccessible. But if you look at Hong Kong now, you can't actually go to schools. And so sometimes rehearsing the future can give you ideas about how to prepare now. So that, that's an example. Thank you. And has social media done more good or bad for modern day society, do you think? W wow. I, I haven't done the futures for this. <laughs> oh, um. Both, I think. It's good, right? It connects us, but it's bad in other ways. My slant is, it's not that social media has done good or bad. We have done it onto ourselves. Because we don't have the self-awareness of how to use social media. So we are, you know, uh, designers read things like the power of habit and get us to get into this infinite loop of scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, but we are not self-aware to know that that's happening to us. So I think it's not about social media, it's about us. So we need to level up our OS. Yeah. And one last question, based yeah. on your presentation, would that mean we design based on assumptions or not? What? <laughs> we always base our design on assumptions. <laughs> uh, 
um, almost everything in this world is assumptions. Uh, yeah, that opens up another two-hour thing, so I don't, I don't want to do that. But if you want to know why is it that way, come and speak to me and why we are all living in assumptions and there's no fact, or very little fact. 1% of the world is fact, but very little. Thank yeah? you. All right. And... And now we'd like to give you a token of appreciation. 